Welcome to Beyond Bite Wings, the business side of dentistry, brought to you by Edwards & Associates PC. Join us as we discuss how to build your dental practice, optimize your income, and plan for your future. This podcast is distributed with the understanding that Edwards & Associates PC is not rendering legal, accounting, or professional advice. Listeners should consult with their business advisors before acting on any of the information that is shared. At Edwards & Associates PC, our business is the business of dentistry. For help or more information, visit our website at enassociates.com. Okay, so here we are for the next episode of the podcast, Beyond Bite Wings, the business side of dentistry. Today we have with us Lynn Ledbetter and myself, Robert Edwards, and Ash Fazula. Hello. Hello. Hi, guys. So what are we going to talk about today, Ash? Oh, man, the dreadful topic of COVID. Just what everybody wants to hear about. Corona. Again. I know, right? Every time I hear the word, I think of Voldemort. (laughs) <laughs> you know, the, the word you're not supposed to say. Who must not be named. Exactly. Yes, the virus who must not be named. They don't want to hear about it, but they do want to hear about it. That is true. So there is some benefit to it. And that's part of the reason why we're doing this episode today. Regardless of how much we don't want to hear about it, we want to end the year on a high note. So we do have a few tips that will go over uh, certain things. What's first and foremost on the client's minds now about coronavirus and just the situation for this year? The number one question that I get asked a lot is uh, regarding their PPP loan, Mm -hmm. the payroll protection program loan. They've received a certain amount of money earlier in the year that they were supposed to use towards payroll, which they have. And then after that, they're supposed to apply for forgiveness. But we've had some changes to by when this money should be spent and how the application should be filled out for the forgiveness. And I feel like a lot of our clients sometimes want to rush through it because there are a couple of things that I don't think they're fully aware of. Because the calls right now are notoriously, it's time to apply for forgiveness. I'm ready. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. And is that what we would say? Would we say, yeah, let's get on this. Let's get it done. Or what's our advice on that? So a lot of people that got their PPP loans in April have the payments coming due in October. According to the original documents. According to the original loan documents. But a lot of the banks have extended the time for that first payment by some six months. However, the actual rule that has been passed by the SBA or passed by Congress puts off those payments for 10 months. So right now there's a big controversy between the banks and the actual rules that Congress has passed. And I think that's why the banks are postponing those due dates because they're starting to see there's a conflict. And so they're giving themselves time to fully understand the rules because the reality is the rules are difficult and they changed 14,000 times. <laughs> they changed daily. They did. They, they did literally change daily. And I think the banks are behind in what the, the new rules say. And so that's part of the problem is that clients are saying, oh, my first payment's due. And according to those documents, that's true. But the reality is it isn't. But there's a fight between the banks and the documents. Plus, the big thing, I think, for the banks is they're really hoping that the loans under $150,000 get automatically forgiven without any further action on part of the borrower. Yeah. That would save them so much time because I think the average loan size was under $150,000. It was. It was more than the average, a vast majority of the loans were under $150,000. But as of the date of this recording, that is not likely to come through this year. If it doesn't pass by the end of this week, which is early October right now when we're sitting here, then it's not going to happen this year. And the odds are it's not going to happen this year. And the bill that's on the table is like an easy application for under $150,000 and then a super easy application for under $50,000. So at the end of the day, we don't know what the rule is going to look like. So why rush for the forgiveness when they may blanket forgive everything and we're going to have expended all this energy trying to jump through? It's actually a very complicated application. I think it's 11 pages, isn't it? It's, it's horrid. Yeah. And when, when the professionals in our accounting firm have difficulty with the application, I don't have a lot of confidence to turn it over to the clients. There's nothing against 
the client's abilities. But the thing is hard and con- conflicting and it, it's just a nightmare. So we really want this forgiveness to go through. And I think, Robert, you'd agree that everyone expects it to. We just don't have an answer. I agree. Everyone that I've heard from, the banks are lobbying for it. The ADA is lobbying for it. Congress, uh, the congressional uh, committees on both sides, Democrats and Republicans, both expect it to pass, but they can't get around to actually passing it because they're still talking about another stimulus bill. Which and is probably not going to come to fruition anytime soon either. I agree. It will, potentially, but not right away. Uh, I think everybody wants to wait for the election and see who's going to control Congress, and then probably in the first quarter of next year, we might have another stimulus bill. So what else are they asking? When the clients call right now, what are the hot topics? One thing that I'm getting a lot of questions about is uh, the clients are telling me they haven't spent their PPP money. They have it sitting in an account. (laughs) And I keep explaining to them, no, if you've paid payroll after you received the PPP funds, you have deemed to have spent the money. So the funds don't have to come out of that account it's sitting in? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And they're still uh, qualified then to get the forgiveness. And for those people who are over 150000 which is honestly not a lot of, of the clients in the dental world, do you think that they're going to have accomplished the forgiveness? Are they going to have used their funds in the required manner so that they will ultimately be forgiven? Yes, I think so. Almost everybody, since they extended the period from eight weeks to 24 weeks, then I think everybody is going to have used the money for payroll. And if not for payroll, then certainly for payroll and rent and the other allowable expenditures. Yeah, I would agree with that. The only hiccup is the the reduction in the full-time equivalent employees and this the reduction in wages. And that's what really complicates the application. If you had employees that refuse to come back, they're going to be thrown out of the equa- equation, but sometimes that's not the case. And if you did have a reduction, then you may not get full forgiveness. But that's you know, yet to be determined. But that, that apparently that won't affect those that are automatically forgiven. Correct. I agree with that. Because I think the attestation that it doesn't exist, the attestation that doesn't exist, I think is going to say just, I used the funds in, on these things as required. And everybody's going to be able to say it. that's not a problem. Okay. And then what else do we want to talk about regarding the uh, uh, loans particular to this year and covid Well, I think Ash's clients are asking him a unique question, which really speaks to the rebound of the practices. And what are they saying to you, Ash? And um, I'm glad you actually mentioned it. So aside from the PPP, the other loan that the clients are talking about is the EIDL loan, um, which is the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. A lot of our clients have received up to $150,000, some a little less. And what has happened is that they have basically utilized a lot of these funds towards the allowable expenses, okay. and that freed up a lot of their patient fees. So some of our clients that are doing fairly well now or hasn't suffered a lot from COVID, they have an abundant amount of cash in their Which reserves. is a great problem to have. <laughs> of course. And now they're wanting to know what can we do with this money. And the first question is, do I pay back the idle loan? And a lot of our clients who are firm believers of not having any liability on their books. Right. They tend, don't like it sitting there no, and they, they want it gone, which exactly. I totally understand. And is that something we would recommend that they do? They really, a lot of the clients just want to get out of debt. and Yeah, they want to repay the money. But I think it's too early. We don't know what the pandemic's going to look like in six months. So we've been telling, or I've been telling the clients to hang on to the funds. The cost of the funds is what you're paying to have that available. If you pay back the money and then later need it, I doubt very seriously if you'll be able to get $150,000 from a bank. And if you did, it would probably take 30 days or more to convince the bank to loan that money to you. The banks loan this money out. Actually, the SBA loaned this money out because it's guaranteed. It's easy to repay over 30 years if you want to take that long. It's a relatively low interest rate. And you're just paying, the interest you're paying now is just for the availability of the funds. Yeah, consider it more like insurance so that you have cash flow. Think back six months ago when your patients weren't coming in and the cash was dwindling and you were like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? If that happens again, you're going to be sorry you didn't have this money still sitting in your account. 
once we know this is all behind us, sure, pay it back. That's not a problem. But until we're sure, because Robert said, the lending environment right now is really tough because they're looking at practice financials that don't fit their typical model. In the past, they've been you know profitable and they've been standardized. And now we've got these two months that look like terrible. And then we've got a couple of months that look fabulous and there's no trend and they're wanting projections, which is something they don't normally ask for. And they think they can't rely on the statements. And so what would normally be a bad loan process is a wretched loan process. And so it's very difficult to get money out of the banks right now. And they're asking for more information. They're take longer to reach a decision mm-hmm. on loans. So it's just really difficult to get a loan, a working capital loan. And now. that's right now when things have calmed down and rebounded. If things take another dive, that's going to that faucet is going to turn off, and then you're going to wish that you had access to those idle funds again. So, we would just recommend you hold on to them until we are all confident that this is in the past and we can turn those back over. And speaking of the practices recovering, what are we seeing? Yeah, what are we seeing? I think it's shocking what we're seeing. I think the majority of the clients that I've looked at are down maybe 10 to 12% for the year in collections from last year, which is remarkable considering that they were closed for maybe 10 weeks. I assume you're talking about net profit. I'm talking about collections because the net profit in some cases is actually up. And that's a whole nother explanation. Yeah, the net profit is definitely up. I think a lot of the revenues are up. The average... I think a lot of the practices, more than half of our practices, their revenue is up. Okay. The average over all of them, it's down about 17%. Okay. So you've got some that are really down, some that are really up. It's really amazing the, the difference, but certainly far more have recovered than are still suffering. And I think there was a general feeling out there that this was going to be the end of the world. And it's showing to be that's not the case. The dentists are resilient. The patients are willing to come back. And the practices are looking good. A lot of that, Robert, people would say is pent up demand. So is that going to come to an end and things are going to taper back down? Or do you think it's going to trend up like it is now continuing? Well, I think to some degree it's already come to an end. The pent up demand was July and August to a lesser extent September. But September is traditionally a poor month anyway for general practitioners. October, we'll see what that's going to be like. But I know a lot of of the GPs are scrambling to fill the chairs now for their hygiene and recall programs. I know I've spoken to a lot of clients in the last, I don't know, two weeks that are really hoping that November and December are typical end of year demand, which is uptick from uh, generally from October and and September. As people try to use up their benefits benefits, for for the end of the year. Exactly. As things are going right now, as things picked up in July and August for those patients that hadn't come in, I don't see any reason to think that the end of the year won't pick up as it typically does as well. I agree. I agree. And so the most recent guidance that has come out is on the HHS program. Uh, Accounting is riddled with acronyms, so I apologize about that. (laughs) The Health and Human Services Department had available some funds that the dentist could apply for that would help supplement their lost revenue. And we knew there would be reporting requirements involved with that. And of course, they delayed as everything has been delayed this year. They delayed releasing what those reporting requirements would be. And now they've been issued. And boy, it's just a staggering read. (laughs) It's not going to be fun. And what's the due date for the reports? The first report, well, hopefully you only have to file one report. It would be due Uh, February 15th of 2021. That's if you've used all the funds on what you're allowed to use them on. If not, you have to, you've got six more months to use those funds and file another report. And when do the funds have to be used by? By the end of June of 2021. So hopefully you're going to use them all by the end of December of 2020 this year. And then you can file that February report and be done. But if not, you do have six more months to utilize the funds. I think that it's going to be I want to say relatively easy in most cases to be able to accomplish it this year because they are letting you go retroactive. So it doesn't have to be from when you got the money. You can go back to as early as March when this thing started happening and you started ordering supplies. Of course, nobody got supplies in March because there were none to have. But once those did start coming in, all that PE, there we go again, (laughs) PPE is going to count towards your healthcare related expenses. 
the plastic partitions that you had to put up? What are some of the things that they were buying as far as equipment, air filtration? What? Air filtration units for the hygiene rooms. That was the main thing. Lights. I'm sorry? UV lights oh, yes. in some cases. UV lights to kill the bacteria. Yeah. So all of those are going to count. So the hope is that will be enough to offset what you received from HHS. And if so, that would be a fairly easy filling out of a report and then you'd be done with it. What's actually just as complicated is the metrics that they're asking for as far as your employees. They want employee metrics and patient metrics, things that are really of no consequence. And at the end of the day, if you didn't spend all your money, there's another component of lost revenue. But we think the reality is that lost revenue is not going to come to fruition. So that's not going to play into the equation because they're making you throw out whatever you spent with the PPP funds. And when you throw that out, there's not a lot of less revenue because it it originally was going to be lost patient fees, gross fees, and now they've changed it to net income, which is a completely different number. And so in a way, the public was hoodwinked uh, because the rules have changed. But here's what I would say. The first time they opened the portal for the application to the dentist, it was really complicated. We had to fill out um, full-time equivalent employees and your revenue mix and all of these things wasn't super complicated, but it was more complex. And this is for the HHS? This is for the HHS, but uh, fees, right. But by the end of it, when you could, they just recently closed the portals. By the end of the application process, I think you had to put in your name and like your total revenue or something. So they really slacked up the application process. My hope is that they'll do the same on the reporting requirements, but I, I can't say it's a bureaucracy. And are those grants taxable to the clients? They are taxable to the clients. Unfortunately, almost every dollar you've received is taxable right now. So the expenses you pay with the HHS grants are deductible, whereas the expenses you pay with the PPP funds are not. Currently as it are not. Now. As it stands now, that's correct. Okay. That's, a, that's another big controversy that Congress is debating. So what basically happens if they're non-deductible? How does that affect, let's say, our clients from a tax standpoint? We are going to really get deep into that in the next episode. But basically, it is going to eliminate the bulk of your expenses for a couple month period because you're talking about 24 weeks of payroll not being deductible, but you had income coming in. Even if you didn't, if you talk about just the payroll from when you were closed, you think you're going to have a big loss because you were paying all this money. Well, you're not. So that means your income is going to be, you're basically going to throw out those two months that you weren't open and your income is going to be the same as it has been in the prior year. And that's what's going to be the big surprise. I know a lot of clients when they came back in July had the best month they've ever had in their practice that month, July. And if payroll's not deductible, then their profits are going to be incredibly high. Right. For that month. Right. And that's going to affect their taxes for the year. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I see. And uh, what about some of the other grants that they were receiving? We have a few clients that received some county grants, and I believe they were asked to utilize all these funds by 1231, otherwise return it back. Right. Now, if the clients have basically utilized a big chunk of it using the PPP funds that they received, then what kind of advice can you give them for the remainder of the year where they can spend it and still have it applied towards the county grants? Because they've got to spend, they've got to spend all the money on the PPP required items and then the HHS required items and now the county grant required items. So the concern is that there aren't enough expenses for all of those relief packages that came in. So they may be looking at returning some of those, but The tax effects, they're going to get taxed on them. So if they return them back net after taxes, it's not as big of a hurt as it sounds. I don't know if they're going to be able to spend it all. Robert, what do you think? I think they'll be able to spend it all. But again, it's going to result in an increase in their taxable income this year over last year. And a lot of people just don't understand, uh, aren't going to understand that when they see it. Right. Yeah, you, you definitely need to be watching your taxes this year consulting your advisor, because it's just, it's an abnormal year. That's the bulk of it. It's an abnormal year. And if you expect your situation to be the same as always, 
or to be substantially hurt because of the pandemic, I think you may be in for a surprise and we don't want you to be surprised. So be keeping an eye on it. But as far as the reporting requirements, you're going to have to be keeping ledgers of what you're spending on PPE, how much each piece costs and how many you've bought and all the different pieces of equipment you bought because you're going to have to report all these things back for all of these relief packages. Ash, do you know, because I don't know, are there reporting requirements for these county grants and for these local grants? Yes, uh, a lot of them do require for the clients to maintain invoices, receipts, and to basically show how it was relevant to the business expenses. Basically be able to also show the counties that these funds were not utilized towards any of the other relief grants okay. that were available to them. So, so same thing. You can't use one expense and report it for multiple things. You have to keep different ones. You have to spend different relief packages on different items. And I think to further complicate the issue with the, the personal protection equipment, the PPE, some insurance companies are reimbursing doctors a certain amount per yep, patient for that. Right. If it's reimbursed, it then doesn't count. you can't spend the grant money on it. That's right. That's that's absolutely right. And I think that's one thing that, that they aren't realizing as well. It's going to be a nightmare reporting. Uh-huh. Yeah. Hopefully it'll be fine. We'll all get through it. We'll help you through it. Well, we'll get through it because time <laughs> still hasn't changed. It's Everything true. else has, but there's still 24 hours in a day. <laughs> and we're resilient and this year is not over yet. We still have time. That's part of the reason why we're doing this podcast so we can inform you mm -hmm. that there is still some planning that needs to be done. More importantly, aside from some of the other prior years, I would highly recommend for uh, folks out there listening to us to uh, consider tax planning with your financial advisors Agreed. or your CPA. And if you don't have a professional on hand, feel free to reach out to us. We do cater to clients nationally. We do have experience in this area, in this field for more than 20 years. And we'd like to hear from you if you guys have any other questions. Great. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening today. Be sure to subscribe to Beyond Bite Wings on your favorite podcast platform. For more info, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, or reach out to us on our website. You can also shoot us an email at info at eandassociates.com.